Thanks for joining the session. So today we're going to talk about science communication. I think this is a really interesting topic and um, I will just Pre, uh, ex like immediately start off with introducing the first of our panelists so we can get started. So this will be Anne uh, van der Joigt. I'm not sure if I pronounced your name <laughs> correct. <laughs> um, so Anne actually holds a bachelor in communication and um, uh, was working as a journalist and uh, copywriter before receiving her PhD in neuroscience from the University of uh, Leuven. And Anne uh, then held postdoc positions at the University of uh, Queensland and the University of Lisbon. And by today, uh, Anne is a program manager at the K uh, KU Leuven Brain Institute. And additionally, she's also a board member of the Belgian Brain Council, which aims to um, raise awareness in the public uh, about brain, the brain and its dis disorders, and to also increase um, resources for respective research. And since 2020, um, and as also president of BYS, which is the Belgian uh, Women in Science organization, which supports girls and women in STEM. And uh, we are extremely thrilled uh, that Anna is part of our panel here today, and we look forward to interesting insights from her perspective and experience as a science communicator. So um, if you want to share your slides, and then we're going to hand over to the next panelists. Okay. So, share. Voila, but now I have to start the presentation. And that is always the problem. Yes. Voila. I think everybody now can see my slides, right? Yes, so, perfect. Yeah. Thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> Basically said everything on this slide. So yes, indeed. I don't have a typical um, parkour. So I first started um, journalism and I was a copywriter for several magazines, uh, not science related, uh, by the way. Uh, but I had a clear interest always in writing through my whole career. So when I started my uh, studies, psychology actually I studied at university, um, always there I kept writing like um, articles diary style most uh, mostly uh, then i started my phd in neuroscience at k leuven where i still work now um also there of course writing grants is a major part of your uh, yeah of your career so i was really good at it i think because of my um, background in journalism so i was quite successful in obtaining grants also uh also i kept on doing like science communication and outreach activities uh both on a national and international level i will show you some examples later on and this is now what happened two years ago during the pandem pandemic. I uh, switched fields from Cliff, yeah, being a researcher now. I'm the research manager of all the brain researchers at K Leuven. Um, and I still organize, of course, events related to science communication and outreach. So um, clearly, I have several things that I organize and related to several uh, audiences. So, for instance, we um, for this first. Um, workshop I invented. It's called the smell challenge in which uh, children are also sometimes the adults or grandparents have to recognize uh, smells blindfolded. So it's really cool because it's really easy to set up. So in this case, we did it at several festivals. This was like at the Sound of Science Festival, really huge with tents, DJs, but also then experiments. So I was part of this and it was really good to start experimenting with this kind of um, activities with children. Uh, because it's really difficult to explain sometimes, like for instance, this smell challenge is related to olfactory uh, discrimination, which is uh, hampered in neurodegeneration. So it's a really good tool to explain difficult resources to children, I think, um, an easy um, yeah. step. Then the second audience is a bit more complicated, the teenagers, because they ask really a lot of questions and they're really interested. But it can be like very intense, these workshops. So I then um, managed to make my workshop more uh, for this audience, also about smell, of course. But then I also uh, explained my research that I did in the lab. So I work with animals, as you can see, rodents. And I used there also several tests uh, related to not only olfactory memory, but also to uh, orientation, of course. My main subject here was uh, an Alzheimer's disease mouse model. So I showed them some uh, movie snippets from the movie Finding Nemo, in which we see Dory, uh, the character that also has a bit of a dementia issue, we think. Um, so it was something to relate to their, uh, yeah, to their, uh, to the children's age. Um, of course, uh, a lot of questions. So it kept on going and going, but it's really rewarding, I must say, for this age group. Um, you can see here also on the head, 
they have all a cap. So this is something also that the children like. So if you give some uh, gadgets, it's always cool. Um, then the last audience, of course, is the adults. I must say also the uh, mixed uh, audiences. So for instance, when the children come to the workshop with their parents and grandparents. So here you can go more into depth. So I had a few um, kind of science lectures. I think you all know it. So basically it's talking about science in a pub and uh, it's really fun. I think it's 15 to 20 minutes approximately and people can ask like questions afterwards. So it's really cool. I like this uh, and I also try to get my researchers at Leuven doing this. It's really basic and low threshold. Uh, besides this, we also have Sobok science. I think it's also something that uh, it's, it came from UK. So normally it's in, of course, outside that people stand then literally, literally on a Sobox and explain their science to uh, passerby. But here it was during the COVID. So it was like a videotaped um, uh, lecture that I gave there, also explaining then um, my research to the audience. So there you can also go in depth really and explain things. Um, uh, the final thing that I also did, but this is really intense. It, 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 it's it's uh, really time consuming. It's making movies. So uh, we had there a crew visiting the lab. Well, I can show you a small part. I'm not sure if... So this was with a professional camera crew that came by um, the lab. So it took a lot of time investment also. Everything would have to be clean in the lab, of course. Um, Ethics had to agree with this because we were filming animals. So it, it's really professional. And then it was also used during the COVID to show to um, school children because there was no school. So they also, uh, I didn't know this, but they also broadcast this on national television in, uh, in Holland. So not only my, of course, but also other lectures. So this was quite fun. The same here, University of Flanders, it's called. Um, it's also a lecture of 40 minutes uh, around the topic. So there also you can go into depth and it's really nice. It's professional. Um, they have also then uh, like info charts that they blend in. So all these different types of communication are really interesting, but very time investment. Um, final thing that I managed to organize was also during the COVID when I um, yeah, just switched fields from being a researcher and writing research grants to more uh, management. Um, I wrote this um, science communication for the European Researchers Night. I don't know if you know this from the European Commission, Marie Curie. Um, this is really a big thing because it's uh, a lot of money, of course, it's European, uh, to organize events during the last week of uh, September always. Uh, and yeah, I submitted these grants during the Christmas holidays and in May we got the news that we got the grant. So this was with Be Wise. I couldn't do it alone, of course, with Belgian Women in Science. And then we had two full days of science experiments in Brussels in the um, National Museum of History. So with the dinosaurs, really nice background and also in the planetarium. So this was for mixed audiences, as you can see, workshops, but also for uh, adults movies. Um, so basically, you can also see the after movie here because this was a big grant. We got like big resources. It's really one once in a lifetime opportunity, I think. Um, yeah. I think we can send the slides afterwards so you can all these these things. But it is really that top notch thing that I managed to um, organize. Basically, if you are um, doing a science communication activity, it's important to identify your audiences and you have to adapt your message to the audience. So for instance, what I always try to do is draw the crowds in. So play on their curiosity. Yeah? For instance, with the smell challenge, uh, it's really cool because then they have to wear a blindfold. So the surprise effect is really nice. Uh, always break down your message and blow it up. Yeah? So make small things uh, big. For instance, uh, as a scientist, often we think, yeah, my research is not that important or it's really something not that, uh, that can relate to the, the, the audience. It's, uh, let's say, natural life. But there is always something in every research story to tell. So it's really important that you recognize this. You also keep the message simple. Eh? Um, yeah, speak the language, of course. Uh, use analogies like I did with uh, the Pixar uh, movie from Finding Dory. Um, engage the senses is always nice. Experience factor. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also something that sticks into the memory of people if they um, the feeling during your workshop, your communication, um, something that they will take home. Also take, uh, let them take something home like physically. So this is the gadget thing that I also suggest to do. If you have something nice uh, related to your, um, to your science field, some, something that they can take home is always nice for the audience. And they will also then come back to the next workshop you give. It's always fun. I think that's basically it. So 
So now I have to stop share. Voilà. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. That was a lovely presentation. We'll move on to our next uh, panelist, which will be Ben, just to give you a heads up. <laughs> so Ben Osborne received his PhD from Virginia Tech for using mass spec to study the cell walls of bacterial pathogens. After that, he performed two postdoc fellowships, one at John Hopkins University and the other at National Cancer Institute, where he worked in the field of cancer transcriptomics and proteomics. After his postdocs, um, Ben, sorry, just, I think my, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, after his postdocs, Ben traveled the globe as a senior field application scientist in proteomics for Thermo Fisher Scientific and contributed to the setup of proteomics workflows in over 160 labs around the world. Today, he has returned to John Hopkins as a faculty member in the Department of Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences. Besides being an expert in proteomics, we invited Ben today because he's the founder of News in Proteomics Research, the most famous and frequently visited mass spec and proteomics blog there is. Uh, it is dedicated to breaking down today's most relevant advances in the field. And as we all know, Ben is certainly an expert in science communication, and we are really excited and uh, we welcome you to uh, conduct a panel discussion today. Uh, over to you, Ben, if you would like to share your slides. I would. And thanks for that. I don't how about I didn't give you that intro. <laughs> <laughs> we figured it. <laughs> okay, does this work? Um, maybe yep. it's here. Okay, so so um, uh, anytime I think about um, science communication, since I don't do grown up things uh, like Anne does, um, I, I do very uh, American social um, uh, science communications. Uh, so uh, <laughs> very, there's nothing positive about it at all um, in most cases. So um, uh, I did. Wait, will this work? Oh, hey, yeah, no. So, um, uh, but but despite all these things, um, I, uh, yeah, you was I tricked you Subo into allowing me to actually uh, have a position in social media. So, um, the the thing I always think about first is uh, if I'm gonna give people advice, it's um, it, it, please don't do what I did. Um, and let's talk about perils uh, where where things where problems do come up. And so, um, you know, and. and and the thing that I really, really tried not to do uh, is to put anything bad out in the world um, because they stay there forever, right? And so if you did, you know, if, if you, for example, you know, tweeted or, or, or put something out on social media that had the title that, you know, some jackass has done good into pig, did lousy proteomics and published it in a turd journal, then, you know, that's out there forever, right? And you don't know who those people are, even if uh, that's just, uh, you know, just an awful, stupid thing to do. Um, you, you really just don't want to have that kind of negativity out in the world. Um, and and the, the other things I think that are really important to keep in, in, in mind are that, uh, you know, social media posts uh, really do have and can have, you know, really negative impacts on your career, right? So um, I think, um, you know, uh, we'll just go through some examples, right? So uh, my, my, Silly blog was down following uh, ASMS 2015 um, for posting the actual cycle time of two high resolution instruments. Um, that I had to be shut, uh, yeah, I had to shut down the blog for. Um, there was, uh, yeah, now um, this got a lot of attention. I don't know why, but uh, I had to shut down the blog for a while. Um, uh, uh, at, an, at a point, a, a Psy, uh, Pop Psy magazine actually took a quote from uh, from my blog and uh, set me up as, uh, you know, as as uh, it quoted me as an employee of a Fortune 500 company um, and as if I had some sort of expertise in what I was talking about. Um, so that um, I, um Dr. Brenda Kessler is an amazing human being. I think that uh, she said that uh, you know, in you know, 15 years with this with a certain company, that she never got to meet all of her uh, HR representatives until she hired me. And um, and then in 2016, um, yeah, trying to follow all the rules. Um, yeah, I still had to shut down the blog for a while to keep my job. And then uh, at that point, I really had followed the rules, and I said, okay, um, I've actually just 
everyone's just tired of me now. I should go somewhere else. So, so, so these things do, they, they can have negative impacts on you. They can follow you. And, and some other examples I think that popped up, um, uh, is, you know, really when you're using some of these platforms, uh, their ability to identify your time and place can be an issue. Um, as someone that honestly, I'm not even joking, was not me. And, um, uh, that the person in question is way too, uh, yeah, um, is super cool. And, and this probably won't get back to the said person, but, um, the person was supposed to be doing a work from home and, um, accidentally to be a location from a beach on a wrong continent, right? And so, so that was out there in the world that you know that she was, he or she was uh, was somewhere awesome where uh, on the wrong continent, you know. So, um, and you know, and, and timestamps can and uh, can be used against you. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, you know, there's if you if you're looking for you know a career in industry or if you're just a, a grad student who is, is pretending to be sick or something, you know, tweeting from different locations and different timestamps, you know, those are things that, that can and will follow you that can be you know used to, to, to really impact you. Um, you know, you can uh, fudge these things, and in fact, uh, the blog posts uh, for a long time uh, were were ran through a, 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 a clock that was set incorrectly on purpose, so they would just pop up at random points in time, so that um, you know, I can never be you know, accused of, of posting from somewhere where I should have been doing something else, right? Um, so we're going to go through my tips, which um, uh, in, in general, you know, it's, it's just be, be positive, uh, not critical, right? And, and you know, there's a time and a place for trolling, and that's, you know, that's that's when you're reviewing for JPR. Um, when in doubt, you know, just don't post it. And, um, you know, and then here, uh, I would just go with the follow-up. Um, so enjoy, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation, but uh, yeah, thanks for letting me waste your time. Well, thanks a lot, Ben, for joining us today. And uh, I now have the pleasure to introduce our last panelist, uh, which is uh, Dr. David Tapp. Um, David received his uh, PhD from the uh, University of Washington, where he trained uh, with John Yates, uh, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, when he subsequently joined the faculty of the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, as an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Biomedical Informatics. And uh, in 2015, um, David joined the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, South Africa. And since uh, last year, he's actually positioned in Paris at the Institut Pasteur. And uh, David maintains an excellent website, um, picking up the tab, and a YouTube channel, which are extremely useful, free online training material included um, for bioinformatics and biostatistics. And I can, like for those of you who haven't um, looked at this before, I can highly recommend to take a look after the webinar. And yeah, we're excited that David is here today. And um, uh, so the stage is yours now. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, I've kind of framed my slides around some of my very first adventures in teaching um, because a lot of things that I did then were a little controversial within my department, and I'm not sure that all of them were ever fully accepted. So I, I think of myself still as a teacher in training, um, having gone through grad school without any training in how to teach a class. Uh, like a lot of uh, postdocs, I was put in front of a classroom for the first time and told to mostly figure it out. So uh, over time, I've taught at a, a variety of different institutions, um, and I've begun thinking of my career as being uh, less emphasizing on, on things like job security and more on sampling what the world has to offer. So um, that has its pluses and it has its minuses. And at the moment, I'm getting ready to move back south to South Africa because I feel a great sense of mission about teaching there. I, I get to teach topics that those students might otherwise get no exposure to. So um, I find it very fulfilling to do that. Um, Okay, let me make sure I've got my slides highlighted. There we go. So uh, I would start with a problem I was facing as a, an assistant professor at Vanderbilt. I had finally been given complete control of the bioinformatics course that students across the interdisciplinary graduate program took at, Vander, at Vanderbilt. Um, so I was trying to serve students within my own department, met, uh, biomedical informatics, plus people coming in from genetics and microbiology and so on. So I made this, this decision early on to make this class as open to people across biomedicine as possible. I'm not going to make the assumption that everybody must learn how to write software to take the course. And 
instead they would try to, we, we would talk conceptually about what went on under the hood in, in these different tools. Um, and I decided from an early stage, since I ran my own group web server, I would make PDFs of the slides available publicly, that just anybody could download them. You don't have to be logged into uh, uh, any of these, any of the tools we have for online classrooms, just anybody with a web browser could reach it. And I posted an MP3 of the lecture because I thought that if they could hear what I was saying and see the slides, that was really enough. Uh, and so I bought a, la a lavalier microphone through the, the classroom budget to, to have a, a good sound recording. That was actually just fine, but there were some things that we encountered along the way that I think are worth thinking about today as well. They're just as relevant um, with the, the modern ways that we would share classroom videos. Uh, the first was that a, uh, an unscrupulous uh, website, I forget which one it is, there are plenty of services of this type, um, grabbed all of my lectures off of the public web server and then began charging people for access to them. I sent them a very sternly worded lecture uh, in an in, in email about uh, what particular place they could all burn for their behavior and explain that they really needed to take my intellectual property down. And they said, okay, well, when we hear it from a lawyer working at Vanderbilt University, we'll, we'll get back to you. So basically nothing happened. They suffered no consequences whatsoever for charging money for access to something I was giving away for free. That didn't really go down well. And it, it's remained with me this idea that anything I make available for free, somebody else might just steal. That's not great, but it's how things stand as things are today. But I would ask you to, to ask the question, was it actually legal for me to share those courses freely? Um, I, would, I would start by saying, I always notified the students that I was making an audio recording. And if they made a, a comment or a question in class that showed up on the recording that could be picked up by my little uh, la, uh, lapel mic, that that might be part of the recording. So if they made comments in class, unless they specifically told me to edit that bit out, they, their, their voice might be contributed to a public recording. And that generally worked out. I never had anyone really pitch a fit about it. And uh, they always knew that if they asked questions after class at the end of the, the, the lecture, that part of the recording would not be included. So that was fine. Um, I also asked though, did the course that I was teaching belong to Vanderbilt University or did it belong to me? I still don't really have a very solid answer to this question. And I, I'm under the impression that it's actually going to depend a lot on which department you're part of. So my decision to put everything online was not something I discussed with my department chair or with my vice chair for education or with the, uh, the, the graduate student committee, nothing. Uh, I just said, I'm gonna do this. And I used the principle that it's, it's easier to get forgiveness after the fact than it is to get permission beforehand. Um, I've, I've got the fuller quote written down there at the bottom in the form it originally appeared in 1846, but it is certainly possible to get yourself in hot water as Ben, I think alluded to, uh, by making something available that not everyone feels should be available. You know, if, if students are paying so much to get tuition, uh, uh, to, for their tuition fee to be at Vanderbilt University, giving away the content that they're receiving for free might not be okay. Okay, so on we go. Um, we very, very frequently see today um, kind of the, the miniature talking head video where, um, for example, over there at the left, you see me appearing down in the bottom right corner, and then I've got my slide taking up all of the, the video space. I, I, I would note that this is one of the worst ways to handle uh, video for making compelling content. That if you're going to have a, a format that's capable of storing motion at 30 frames a second, you might as well have something moving for them to look at. Um, so I've really made a big push towards having the slides be the minority contributor on screen. When I make a video available on, uh, on YouTube, I almost always create a PDF that I stick onto my, uh, my Google Drive I use a link to that so that students can print off the slides and they can uh, flip through these and make comments in, in their own copy of the slides as they proceed. And I can still make allusions to what's appearing in the slides because I have a TV on behind me that I can point back to and say, well, in this part of the, in this part of the slide, I'm showing an, an example of this type of diagram, blah, 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 blah. 
So I, I think that there, there's been sort of an assumption that the speaker is the least interesting part of what should be on screen, but really our eyes are attuned to, to catch all kinds of nuance from faces and from the way that we speak with our hands and so on. So I, I would really urge you to think about what gets all the real estate on screen when you do these kinds of presentations. Um, th this is a very basic set of points, but I really think it's worth saying out loud that the venue in which you're doing science communication has a much bigger impact than simply the duration. You know, we, we get a, a, the opportunity to speak at a conference and we, our immediate question is, well, how many minutes do I have? But that's really one of the least interesting questions to ask about the venue for which we do science communication. If I'm doing a course for my department, I'm going to have a very different set of expectations than doing a short course at a conference. Um, certainly, you're, you're not going to have to think about assessment if you're teaching a short course at a conference. Basically, if their bottom is in a chair for the requisite number of hours, you hand them a certificate at the end and they're, they're a graduate, right? That's not how things work within a, 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 a course that's got standard curriculum and needs assessment and so on. Um, doing a research seminar as a local is very different than I uh, than, than my experience would be if I'm, I'm going to a distant university and doing a presentation of my work. I often think if I'm doing the, the a department seminar for my own department, that it gives me a lot more leeway into what kinds of topics we bring in. But one of my favorite lectures of, of all the ones I've taught was about um, what, is, what is the value we gain as citizens in, in becoming scientists. And I think that's actually one of my, my most entertaining lectures. And people actually came away from my lecture saying, you know, I feel better about what I'm doing today. I don't get that feedback generally. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, I would also say speaking to the community has a lot of, uh, a lot of different possibilities as well. I, I saw that Anne mentioned Pint of Science a moment ago. That program has made it all the way down to South Africa. So I got to do a, a program of that sort down there where you were literally speaking in a pub to people in the public who saw that this kind of an event was going on. It's a very, very different kind of audience than the typical academic speech. Um, certainly, we also have some pretty cool interdisciplinary programs out there, um, places where we're working with local artists to see um, curated collections of visuals that have been produced, for example, from confocal microscopy or other types of imaging modalities to, to share those with the, the world to say that science can in fact be beautiful as well as informative. So I would ask you to think about formality, how much gravitas you must have. You know, if I'm speaking for my department, I'm gonna be a little looser than if I'm speaking for a, a grand rounds at a, a medical school, for example. Um, how careful am I going to be about citations, about giving specific papers that buttress particular points? How careful am I going to be about the funding source that is paying for my salary while I'm doing these things? These all matter. Um, how much fun I have with a talk and the ways in which I have fun with a talk will also change. It's very, very hard to make me stop using silly metaphors, so they tend to show up all the time. But I'm much less likely to share a personal story from when I was a kid or something, um, if I'm doing a, a formal talk for another department. And certainly in jokes really don't work if you're working with people who come from outside your field. So being uh, able to tell jokes that are going to, to match with their experience levels appropriate. And of course, the amount of, of knowledge that you assume in your participants is always going to be critical. I would give one piece of advice on this score, which is that no one likes to hear all new things as part of a talk. If you tell them a few things at the start that they already think they know, you're not going to hurt yourself. You're not going to hurt their feelings. It gives them a, a point of the ladder to latch onto as they try to climb up the rest of your talk. So giving them some bit at the beginning that they can, uh, that they can get started with is always a good idea, I think. Okay, with that, I'm gonna take my slides off screen because I think your questions are going to be very interesting things to talk about. Thank you, David. That was really interesting and very, very interesting stories uh, to hear. Uh, without, I think we, yeah, we're running a bit late, so we'll quickly move on to the panel discussion. Uh, and then we will address the questions that are in the chat and um, feel free to drop in, uh, but we'll quickly start with the first one. 
Uh, how can ECRs, that is both PhD students and postdocs, get involved in science communication? Is it normal to approach blogs, magazines, podcasts, etc., cetera, to um, ask to be involved? Or do these typically require an invitation? Um, and do you want to go first? Sure. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think they need an invitation. I think, first of all, it's something that you either in a way are doing already, like uh, a blog, uh, for instance, it's really cool, like uh, some kind of a personal diary when you do a postdoc abroad, uh, was in my case, the start of it. Um, but I think, no, definitely you can address organizers for events also easily, kind of science people are very friendly people. Uh, I think it, it's, it's, it's your, um, it has to be on your own initiative, yeah. Um, ben, do you want to go next? Yeah, no, um, uh, you know, I, I think generating your own content is something that's 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 easy to do. If the question is more of, um, you know, how, uh, you know, um, how do you get involved in other things that are that are already established? Um, uh, reach out. You know, um, you know, I, I, I'm constantly reminded by how few scientists there actually are on Earth, right? That you you get into these, you know, there aren't that many of us, and and so, um, you know, um, yeah, if if there's something that you would want to get involved in, yeah, I I would say, yeah, um, you know, the worst that can happen is you're told no. So, I think a lot of people assume that that associate professors and full professors would want to do all the talking themselves. But I got to say, um, I get tired of hearing myself. <laughs> Generally speaking, I feel that there's much more work to do at all times than I could possibly handle. And if I know that a junior person is willing to do an engagement opportunity, I'm happy to discuss with them the best way to, to tackle that. But generally speaking, where, where a junior person is willing to do it, I'm very, very grateful for it. So I, I think that Often we would assume that, oh gosh, we're gonna to have to take that on ourselves as well, but it's it's so much better if you know a junior person can take it on instead. Perfect, thank you so much. It's good to know that it's easy to reach out and I, I guess that people are mostly happy to, to get people involved. That is good to know. Um, then uh, maybe we get to the second uh, question that we prepared, which is uh, like a question of whether science communication is a matter of practice makes perfect or if there are if you can recommend specific things that people can do to actively improve on their communication skills mm, yeah practice makes perfect but of course you need a lot of practice so <laughs> i would say you have to start somewhere right everybody must make mistakes and definitely um if you're writing for instance for a magazine or a newspaper uh, journalists have their own way of <laughs> presenting your uh, what you said. So always read your uh, articles before you <laughs> have them printed, of course. Um, same goes for uh, other activities, but for sure, I think it's something that you will uh, you will be trained in. Like everything, you get better at it. Yeah, definitely. I, I back that up entirely. It's 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 a practice thing, um, and. And, and I think, you know, it's just like in the lab where, you know, the, the third time you do a protocol, it's like all of a sudden not a miserable experience. And uh, the first two, it's, yeah, I, I, I always hate that. It, you know, and, and then by the third one or the fifth one, you don't need the protocol anymore. So I, I think it's just, it's, it's a, it's a putting time into it thing. Um, we're, uh, we've, we've been recording podcasts uh, on proteomics and uh, the, the first couple uh, um, are very painful to listen to. And, and uh, the, the, the new ones as they're, uh, as, as they're coming off from, from the editor, uh, they're much better. And so, but you don't wanna like call, call somebody up and say, hey, can you, can you record this again? So I, I think all of those things, it's just, it's just getting your time in. I, uh, I had parents who always encouraged me to be out front, and my dad always had the camera. And when I was learning to read, my mother made cassette tapes of my learning to read. And one of the consequences of this was that I thought I was a great speaker in high school. And the reality, I think, is that if I encounter any of my first few talks, I, I, I it's so much cringe. So, so much cringe. Um, along the way, uh, a lot of people have taken great pity on me and have given me more chances to, to do my thing. And um, I would particularly praise the people in uh, Toastmasters International 
Um, it's an organization with chapters basically everywhere. Um, and it's very good at helping speakers stop saying um and ah when they're between thoughts. So uh, it took a lot to beat that out of me, but um, a lot of friends in those groups uh, did a lot to help me there. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Matthew, do you have a question that you wanna ask now or? May I ask, just do a quick follow-up. You, you, you talk about uh, receiving feedback and all three of you are in a position where it may be a little bit harder to get feedback now. And a lot of ECRs are transitioning in a part where they'll do a talk, they'll go to the conference and then they'll hear, oh yeah, good talk. And then they'll ask a question. And by the good talk, was that really a good talk? And so I'm just curious, could you give tips about receiving feedbacks when you're practicing? A, what are the techniques you're using to get that kind of feedback at a certain stage of your career? It could be difficult. If I could jump in here, I would say that Zoom and Microsoft Teams and so on, they have been very, very challenging for getting feedback on lectures that so many of our environments have all the students with their cameras turned off. When I, when I look at academic Twitter, it's very frequently featuring messages praising the one or two students in the class who leave the camera on. Teachers don't mind seeing the occasional catwalking by either. I'm not sure I can contribute anything here. Um, I have, uh, there's something in my brain broke about what other people's opinions are and that's in influencing me in any way. So I, I don't think I can contribute anything useful here to, to this. Yeah, if I can uh, say something about my science communication for like big audiences, I always practice it with my mom. She uh, she went to school until she was 14. Um, so if, if she understands it, I mean, then also the, the audience will understand it. So you can practice uh, with your family, <laughs> for instance. Thank yeah, you. that's actually, yeah, great. <laughs> I think you all try to do that with our families. Um, all right, moving to the last question for the session. Uh, should science communication efforts be included in a CV? And if so, how much or how little? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult one. So are you talking about academic CV, of course? Yes. So um, yeah, I put some things in there for myself. Um, links to, for instance, a movie is really great. Uh, if you have a movie, of course, uh, or a magazine thing you wrote. Um, yeah, science communication outreach for me, it was a big part. Um, also there, I think it's depending on the kind of yeah, job you're applying for, but I don't think it will hurt. Um, yeah, it's not really something I thought about when I submitted my CV, to be honest. I'm not also didn't ask for feedback why I was chosen for this management job. Was it because I read it so many science outreach activities? I don't know. Um, but I, I think it's a good idea, actually, next to your KPIs, like publications, but also like um, science communication efforts is something that I think also the grants are um, paying attention to it. If you apply for a European grant, science communication is a big part, I think. So um, I think it's important yeah, to mentally do your CV. Yeah. <clears throat> If, if I could draw a quick distinction, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on you, Ben, um, but there's, there's a distinction between how do you get attention drawn to communication you've produced and how do you credential it? I don't think that any academic department is going to give you tenure because you're well-received on YouTube. Um, that's just, that's really, really far from the way they think. So, it's, it's possible that you will get far better networking opportunities because people have heard of you on Twitter or whatever. Um, sometimes not for the stuff you think either, um, but uh, generally speaking, I think that most hiring committees probably don't care very much whether your, uh, whether your blog site is well-maintained or well-visited. And that's hard. Um, but I tend to think most people who really stick with a social media outlet are people who feel like they really must do this thing, not necessarily because they get lots and lots of viewers and readers, though, I mean, God bless us if we can get them. 
<laughs> yeah, if I if I have 50 people read a blog post I've written in a day, I feel like an unqualified success. Can, can I add something small? Because I'm com coming from uh, like brain uh, research. So for me, like uh, when I wrote a grant, typical grant, it was a Belgium grant. It was not that large, but I got it because I mentioned also that I will organize uh, lectures for patient organizations. So because of our research in neurodegeneration, it's really important that um, also uh, the public gets the audience. So in this way, I really put an effort in informing the, the public, like uh, yeah, in this case, senior people and inviting them to the lab with lab visits and also lectures and workshops. So I think uh, in this case, it was really worth that you show that you're bringing your um, research outside the lab to the other stakeholders, like politicians also, uh, basic organizations. And um, I honestly, I think that it's uh, it, there's going to be a generational shift here and in, in how this is received. I think at some point, um, uh, I can't share much from a, 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 a study section, um, but um, there was certainly a point where uh, where someone applying for a fellowship had a whole lot more social media activity on their CV um, and not uh, and not as many papers, right? And uh, for for some reviewers and um, you know not just you know there there was a clear uh, when when that argued when that discussion kind of went off the rails with the reviewers and you know, there there felt like there was a generational disparity there where it it was considered by um, by maybe the uh, by one generation that that was more of a a sign of a distraction right of someone who um, is is very easily taken to do silly things right rather than than um, than maybe the other side um, of, of a of what appeared to be maybe a, a a generational disparity where it was taken to be a lot more of a positive thing right so and, and i think that maybe we'll see that shift with time and, and also i think david's point really you know is just fantastic on in terms of you know is it attention uh, or is it actually something that that is is positive so um you know if if it's if it's through something fancy and official looking then it's probably worth a whole lot more even if it's the exact same content right so versus it's something that doesn't have a perception of the quality or it's you know it's there's oh my some you know crazy eccentric person you know that's the platform you're posting it on so those are three cents Okay, um, so uh, this uh, these were basically our pre-prepared questions, but we already have a lot of questions uh, that were posted from the audience. And um, so Sayantani and I are going to go through some of the questions that have been posted so far. Uh, but if you want, you can also, from the audience, raise your hand and we can promote you so that you can ask your questions live uh, if you want to do that. So um, maybe we go uh, to uh, one question um, uh, that it was posted to Ben directly. So um, someone basically said that they enjoy your blog posts quite a lot, but they were curious how you actually decide on which manuscripts and uh, what kind of work you actually write a blog post on. And um, yeah, so maybe you can comment on this. Sure. Yeah. No, so um, I'm, I'm not naturally an intelligent person, and and I and I um, and I'm, I'm very very aware of that. And and so in order to keep up with smart people, uh, I've taken like the Naruto uh, approach, where I just work really really hard. And so I, I set a rule about ten years ago where I have to read a paper every single day, and it's just a rule. And and to keep track of it, I I, I make these blog posts. The ones that that get posted, the ones where I can say very, something very positive about it. Um, something that, that I'm enthusiastic about it, I enjoy it a lot. Um, and, and so what actually, when I see the, the side of the blog that I see has uh, far more posts on it than what are actually publicly on, on that side. So, um, you know, I, and, and sometimes it's arbitrary. Sometimes people send me papers. Uh, a lot of times with, with the advent of, you know, of, of Twitter becoming a big thing, those are things that are, people are excited about. I read them. And, and generally, you know, if I can, uh, if I, can understand it, complete it, and actually you know, write a, a summary on it that I like, then it makes the blog. And otherwise, then, then it just stays in my notes. So that, that's what it's for. Thank you. Uh, and from the chat, we have a second question. That's I'll go for the one which is directed to David first. Uh, how do you protect your free materials when you make them free to the public? 
I would say that I have always opted for free access um, above monetized access. So when I make a video of a lecture available via YouTube, for example, I'm given the option of, do I want this to be considered for advertiser supported video? And I always leave that unchecked. Um, if, if the students get the opportunity to watch my, my lecture with fewer ad breaks, um, I don't care that I'm missing out on 20 cents of income. It doesn't, that's never going to matter to me. So um, does that protect the content? Not really. Um, I think most people know that there are plenty of tools out there for harvesting video out of YouTube into files of really crummy quality on your hard drive. Um, I would really rather that students just watch them straight from the web because if they do that, I can actually count how many times a lecture is getting seen. And if they make their feedback there, I, I, I get to know, oh, they didn't understand this point. The next time I teach that topic, I'd better shore that up. So there's very little to protect my slide content from showing up elsewhere or my uh, videos to show up elsewhere. Um, and I've assumed that's a, a feature, not a bug. But I, I did feel very angry when people were, for whatever website, were selling access to free materials. That's, that's, that's insultingly bad. And to follow up the question from the same attendee, I believe, uh, what has the most impact, visual, written, or audio materials, or they are complementary? Let's open to everyone. Who we'll wanna go first? Um, it's it's a it's a learning style thing I think and and uh, um, and you know it would, it would, uh, my 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 uh, bachelor's was actually in education and you know and, and they they kind of break this down in terms of you know it, it's a you know everyone has their own modes of of of, um, of learning and I think that you know what you see is that these various contents uh, get to the people based on their own ability to 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 learn those things so I don't think there's a right answer to that question that'd be my opinion. I would say that when uh, that that a lot of being in the right place at the right time gave a lot of the training I did a much higher profile than it had before. I, I'd been putting lectures online since 2016 um, in in video format, and basically no one was watching them. Um, but at the start of the pandemic, I created a landing page that said, these are all of the lectures and all the different modules that I have online. And suddenly, all these professors who were not in a position to suddenly start teaching online could say, okay, we'll watch this one and we'll talk about it um, in, in a Teams. And that uh, to have that kind of publicity suddenly land on this portfolio of videos was thrilling um, and terrifying at the same time. Um, but I've been really grateful that, in general, the response has been pretty positive about, about these materials. I, was... I think that combining, combining motion of, of the speaker with the stills of the, the lecture slides was, um, was, was a, a, a nice recipe towards people accepting the videos. Uh, thank you, David. I think this was a perfect uh, handover to one of the next questions, uh, which was basically how the pandemic has shaped the mode of science communication. And you already uh, mentioned like uh, like videos, uh, like online learning material to become much more important and visible. Um, maybe you have some additional points on, on this topic. I think it's fantastic, you know, and, and if anything good came out of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the terribleness of, uh, you know, of the pandemic it is how much content has has been generated from from conferences you can attend uh, without, you know, uh, flying, you know, nothing's going to be, you know, the learning experience of flying to a conference and, and just being immersed in it. But, but um, for, for people who can't, you know, do, do a whole ton of conferences and miss that. And 
that this content is now available that you can watch on, uh, you know, at your own convenience um, or, you know, even live, like you're almost at the conference and they're addressing things about this. I think it's really positive, but, um, and so it's nice to find a silver lining now in a couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. So since the pandemic, we also started doing webinars um, about general topics um, for the Leuven Brain Institute to reach people that otherwise we would never reach, because we're working also a lot with patients that are disabled, for instance, and not not really easy for them to come to the to the seminars we do at uh, yeah at the laboratory or at the university. So I think now um, it's really nice that we can put also these webinars on our YouTube channel and people can watch them at their convenience. So yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe we can also like address some of the questions that were just answered in written form so far. And also, I just want to highlight again, uh, if uh, so we're going to stay on for a few more minutes, if, if there are still more questions coming up. So uh, our panelists kindly agreed to stay on for a few more minutes. Um, so um, yeah, raise your hand if you want to uh, like speak up yourself. Um, otherwise, I thought there was one very interesting question about issues with online hatred or like negative um, comments towards your um, science communication and how you actually deal with this. Yeah, if I can start because I'm working with animals. So yeah, of course, there if you post something, uh, yeah, people are always like going to be negative. But Ali, a lot of people actually... <laughs> Um, but there I don't really have an answer, so I try to avoid things on Twitter because I really hate them, the trolls <laughs> appearing. And also sometimes underneath your YouTube video, there can be some hatred there towards your animal experiments. But basically, after uh, a few things that happened in Belgium, also the development of the vaccines in Belgium, it was used, it, it was done in hamsters and rodents. So I think there people actually really know, uh, recognize this uh, necessity of our rodent research. So it's a bit better now since the pandemic, luckily, but yeah, it's not much you can do about it. But I would say don't take it personal, but be careful uh, about what you post exactly. And don't put yeah some images on there, of course. That's really you know, shocking images of like uh, monkeys with brain implants. <laughs> so. And I guess Ben also already had some good uh, advice on not, generally not posting too negative things, right? Yeah, yeah, and and um, and I, and I think I really learned that um, uh, the hard way in that that you know, where I, I had been critical of someone's paper, uh, someone's work. I didn't, and this was a point where I, I didn't know that anyone was actually reading uh, what I was what I was what I was putting out there in the world, and uh, and it really uh, you know, impacted someone else negatively. Um, I'm largely immune to, to, um, to um, you know, uh, the effects of other people's opinions. So as I mentioned, but, uh, but, but I, you know, I think just reiterating that, that, you know, just making sure that, you know, that there, there's really nothing good that can come of, of um, you know, of, of um, being critical or negative about, about it, uh, other people's work where they're obviously putting an effort. The most hurtful thing somebody's ever said to me was probably in uh, student reviews from my classroom, where one of the students offered as feedback, does Professor Tab own anything except polo shirts? Not particularly hateful, but it didn't go down well for me. <laughs> I'm sorry, David, that was actually me. Um, oh, I think we have another question in the chat, uh, and that's for Anne. Uh, any tips you can give for enhancing scientific communication writings in general? Any resources you advise to look at? Um, in general, science communication, right? Oh, my, my son just came in. <laughs> so, I thought, oh <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I think it's better that somebody else answer this because I have now the kids here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, ben or David, would you like to add to it? I have a very simple one. Before you submit your manuscript to publication, read it out loud, literally 
read every word so you can hear it, and your brain will catch stuff that your eye never did. That, that's actually a really good one, and uh, I did something that I, that I, yeah, at least mumble through them um, if I if I care about them. Um, no, and that's all I have. Yeah, that's nothing. Um, so I would encourage we'll... simple sentences rather than long sprawling ones. If you try to, if, if your sentence is as long as a paragraph should be, that's not going to help anybody. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> so uh, maybe there's like one, uh, I, I guess, uh, final question. Um, uh, that was uh, how you can ensure that your blogs and your tutorials actually reach parts of the world uh, where the resources can be very useful. Um, so where, where access might not generally be very easy to these teaching materials. Certainly something I should be doing more often um, is to consider what a blog post looks like on a cell phone. Um, because the, I mean, we, we think of low and middle income countries as places where people aren't using computers, but they're using computers all over the place. They're in their hands. Um, Having, having slides that are legible on a, uh, on a cell phone screen, having media that are compact enough that you can download it without killing your data bill for your, for your mobile phone, it's very worthwhile. I think this is an excellent point. <laughs> um. Yeah, so uh, I think if uh, no one has uh, any additional comments or uh, questions, then um, I, I guess uh, we want to thank. Oh, oh, there's one more question. So just on the right time. So um, uh, there's uh, the question is, what would be the uh, perspective of SciComm in the next 10 years? And will hiring committees consider SciComm impact maybe a bit more in the future? I, I don't think it's going to decrease. That, that's for certain. And, and it's hard to guess what it's going to be like uh, down the road, what, what's going to be the next platform is, you know, as we, as, as we witness the, you know, the, the, the implosion of Twitter, right, that, you know, that any of these platforms that are profit driven, you know, that have, uh, you know, a spark of effectiveness in them, you know, might not be around. So I, I, I it's, it's hard to guess, but I, I could, I would be shocked at the impact could possibly go down in any way. I'm a bit of a catastrophist, and I, I tend to think that societies worldwide are going through a, a really difficult period that goes a lot worse before it gets a lot better. And my belief is that funding for public science is getting more and more constricted, at least in a lot of the parts of the world where I spend my time, because of public lack of faith in science, that people think we're electrocuting bugs for no good reason, <laughs> that, that this is just how we get our jollies. Uh, science communication is much more important in that context, that we, we must justify that what we are doing has relevance to everyday people and makes their lives better. Um, at, at the moment, science is not being well received by the public, but I like to think that that's not inevitable or forever. Uh, you know, I've, I've been called part of the intelligentsia by members of my own family. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean even, but I, I like to think that, um, that people will understand that science does have value, but it will be that way because we teach them that that's true. So we, we must have, all departments must have a, a society facing component that is able to speak a language they understand. Um, I think this was actually a perfect question to end today's webinar because uh, this this was nicely highlighting the you know, growing importance of science communication and to actually reach out not only to our peers but also to the general public and to make people aware of what we're working on and what we're doing and that this actually has impact and importance. And um, yeah, so uh, I guess um, it's time to thank all of the panelists again for joining us today. Uh, at least for me, this was super interesting. Um, and uh, also thanks to all the participants for um, posting so many interesting questions. 
Um, Sayantani, do you have anything else to add? Or? Um, no, I think it was a lovely webinar. I'm, I'm just really honored to be able to share it with you and really thankful to all the panelists for their really interesting insights. And yeah, I look forward to developing some on my own <laughs> for science communication. That's a motivation. Yeah. And thank you, Charlotte, for yeah, organizing and taking care of the admin. I don't know if she's here, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you and good luck everybody with your science communication efforts. <laughs>